Buju Zigwa no Danans and Dijnakaz. Migi Zi and Dodem, O Dawa Zayaganing O Jiboy Anishinabe Kwe Indao. Manomani Zayaganing in Dojaba. I greet you in my Ojibwe language. Hello, my name is Siobhan Marks, and I'm Eagle Clan. I have the extreme honor this evening of being able to tell you Bungi Etago, a little bit about the dress of our grandmothers. Our grandmother's dress is really important to our identity. And the reason for that is it takes us back to the voices of our grandmothers. And to know and understand that, we need to understand that our truth as Anishinaabe is that we did not come here on ships. We did not walk over a frozen landmass. We were put here by the Creator. We didn't come from someplace else, nor did our grandmother's dress. To start in the beginning, I have to start with my own grandmothers, those who loved me and nurtured me, took care of me, encouraged me, and that's what you see here, my great-grandmother, my grandmother, and my mother. They also taught me to sew, which came in really handy when it came time to do workshops for our dresses. I would also like to acknowledge Dr. Corey Wilmot. She was a tremendous friend and research helper to my uncle and I. And speaking of uncles, I need to acknowledge Bud Waverden <coughs> Benesi, Grand Chief of the Three Fires Medicine Lodge in Bad River, Wisconsin, he has done more to help me understand who I am spiritually and my identity piece is Anishinaabe Kwe than I could ever possibly repay. If you're listening or watching Bad Wewedin, know that you are loved greatly. I also need to acknowledge my uncle, the late Neil Opendike, who walked on less than a year ago. My uncle was a tremendous skilled craftsman. All of the beadwork I am wearing and what you see on these dresses are all of his work. It was his life work. He started at the age of 10. He taught thousands of people about Ojibwe regalia, and I honor him tonight in this talk. Going back to this dress, we know that pre-contact, there were as many as 112 million indigenous people living in this part of the world. By the 1900s, those numbers, were, we were decimated to a mere 250,000. What did that mean? That meant that 90, 95% of our peoples were wiped out. We talk about this dress. We've really had a hard time trying to figure out where did it come from? What are the cultural aspects? Why do so few of our women recognize or accept this dress? And this is a big part of that. It was through the decimation, murder, famine, wars, boarding schools that took all of this information from our women. And our women are really having a hard time right now. The murdered and missing indigenous women in this country and in Canada, those are outrageous numbers. It's been going on for years and years. And yet we are only just beginning, beginning to have those conversations, let alone have protections put in place. Our young women, and our young men are all suffering. And that's why the identity piece that we believe this dress will help bring to them is so very important. After the decimation of our people, in came the boarding school era. In Canada, it is referred to as the residential school era. And General Pratt, who started that here in the States, had a motto, and that was kill the Indian, save the man. And what they did to us was they cut our hair. They stripped us of our traditional clothing that was burned or buried in most instances. We were denied the use of our language. In fact, the children were beaten, denied food, or locked away. Many tried to escape those terrible conditions and died along the way, trying to get back to their families and their homes. It was a very terrible time for our people, and it set forth a trajectory for our families what you don't often see are the images of what that did to our women. Our women also, of course, suffered. And so we had girls going in that were also stripped of all of their ways, their language, their customs. They grew into adulthood, and we had 
families having babies that had no idea how to parent. They didn't know how to love and nurture. They had come from such a damaged childhood themselves. And that happened to thousands and thousands and thousands of Native children across this land. What that did, and I'm sorry, I know this is a very somber topic, but this is our everyday reality. The historical trauma happened in the past and it's still happening today. It has caused addiction, depression, disease, poverty. Almost a third of our people today live in poverty. High school dropout rates, homicides, suicides. My family has been touched personally by these things. And we suffer that, our people, four, six, ten times the rates of other ethnic groups in this country. It's a real thing that happens to us, and we're trying so desperately to heal from that. And then again, that is where our grandmothers' voices reach out to us as one part of that healing process. Because we know that the answers to some of this lies in our indigenous knowledge. We know that when our youth understand who they are, where they came from, and where they're going, they do better in school, and that can also help us heal as adults. Our grandmothers fought so hard to hang on to this dress, and that is not wildly known. As you see on the dresses here, we've got three historical eras, and I'm gonna walk you through those. The very first era would have been pre-contact, pre but this one happens to be early contact. And you see our grandmother's dress there. Uh, it, what makes it so brilliant, aside from the straps, are the detachable sleeves that allowed our grandmothers to be able to free their arms to work, or if it was cold or they needed protection, they could easily get back into their sleeves, hopefully easier than I am right now. <laughs> and the same thing was true with leggings. Our grandmothers wore them when it they needed to for protection, and when it was hot, we didn't wear our leggings. The next era is known as the fur trade era, and that era really ushered in a, a big change for our people. We stopped hunting to feed and sustain our families, and instead we hunted to sustain an insatiable appetite in the European market, especially for beaver fur, but other animals as well. In this painting by Eastman Johnson, you see four of our grandmother's dresses, and those are made out of wool. The wool and the ribbon came here as trade items, and our grandmothers, instead of adopting and making things that the European women were wearing, they clung to this dress as an identity piece, and they used those materials to make our dress. And thus was born the very first ribbon skirt for any Anishinaabe Kwe that are in the audience or watching. This is where our ribbon skirts came from. I'm very privileged to have been able to touch and be photographed with a dress that Eastman Johnson commissioned for those paintings. Then comes our darkest time period. This is when we were decimated to 250,000 people. This is when we were forced removed onto reservations and across lands through inhuman means. We were forced marched. Our people were sick and dying along the way and we could not even stop to take care of them, let alone bury them. But out of this time came our most beautiful and memorable look. In the reservation area here, you see it behind me in black velveteen, are those beautiful woodland florals that are still very popular and cherished today. You see a photo there of a woman from the World's Trade Fair, and you see her beautiful florals. And the pictures to the side is a grandmother who I've had the chance to meet, and her granddaughter, who is now a young mother herself, wearing her grandmother's dress. They were actually able to keep that for their family, which is quite remarkable. This is just a close-up of those beautiful woodland florals. They carry the teachings of our plant medicines and our healing. The fourth era, which is something I am so proud to be a part of, is what we call reclaiming. My uncle and I started two years ago taking the story and how to make this dress into our indigenous communities in the United States as well as into Canada. And I've got some pictures to share with you. 
This young Anishinaabe Kwe is working on her dress, and behind her is a banner. We really work hard to show all of the historical facts about this dress, because in our own communities, many, many of the women deny that this really was the dress of our grandmothers. History has done such a job of erasure on us that we had really lost contact with the dress. Here we have a, a woman who traveled to our very first workshop, which was in Oneida, Wisconsin. She traveled from Michigan, and the other woman traveled from Canada to attend that workshop to learn about our dress. We teach the women how to make the dress, how to fit the sleeves perfectly for their body, with the great hope that they will in turn teach others in their community. We ask them not to commodify this dress. This isn't about selling books or patterns or dresses. It's about reclaiming something for our women. This is a beautiful uh, Forest County Potawatomi woman working on her dress. You can see she's sewing silver brooches onto her straps. And last, but certainly not least, of the many teachings that our grandmother's dress has brought to us is the realization that our culture has never been lost. It's just been waiting there for us to remember it. Miigwech.